Hi, everybody. Um, so this is a joint work with Jennifer Pekin and Antal spector -Zabuski. Um And today, um, I want to motivate this work before I start telling you about it by saying that I like to look at pictures of cute animals on the internet. Um, and I feel like this is a common motivation and a common thing for a lot of us. So I'm going to use it as a running example throughout the talk. And in particular, um, I'm a Haskell programmer. So uh, when I want to look at pictures of animals, I turn to my favorite programming language to do so. So you know, maybe I have some API that uh, gives me uh, some get animal function. Um, that's just an I/O event that gives me a picture of some sufficiently cute animal, um, and I have some display function that takes some picture and uh, displays it to the screen in some particular manner. And say I want to look at three pictures of animals, so I just write myself a little program. Um, oh, hmm, we're cut off at the bottom of the slide. Um, is there anything we can do to, to get the bottom here? Um, and uh, I know that you were all awaiting some, some animal pictures. So uh, let's uh, get right to that. So I'm going to run my function. Um, and as you can see, I'm, I'm downloading a picture of an animal. And then I'm downloading another one. And. By the way, uh, a lot of these animals are either pictures of my friend's animals, uh, or uh, I sent out a call on Twitter for people to send me pictures of cute animals for this talk. I told them it was for research purposes. Um, so it was kind of slow, right? Because we were downloading the first animal and then displaying it before we even started downloading the next one. And as good programmers, we know that this kind of I.O., when you're just reaching out to the network and you're waiting for it to send you a bunch of data, like you're not CPU bound. You can be doing other stuff in the meantime. You can be downloading a lot of things at the same time. But we're sort of forced to do this sequentially because so far we haven't introduced any kind of concurrency. And yeah, we could muck about with like threads and like uh, all sorts of concurrency primitives and like streaming things over channels and mvars and stuff like that. But a lot of the time, that's just overkill for what we want to express. We want to say things in a nice, clean framework. And a lot of people, especially lately, I mean, it's been sort of the buzz, as Gershom was saying earlier, have been turning to event-driven programming to solve problems like this in a really elegant manner. So event-driven programming goes by a lot of different names. Um, I, I've heard the, the type of um, events be referred to as, well, event, um, or future, or deferred. Um, and so I'm going to just unify this and say, um, let's call all of these things diamond, um, which you could also pronounce event or eventually. Um, and there, there's a reason for this pick of a symbol, because it comes from modal logic, where diamond represents that something will eventually happen. And what, what is an event but something that will eventually happen? <laughs> so your favorite event-driven programming framework surely has more primitives than what I'm putting up on screen. But this is enough for what we want to talk about today. Um, and I'm, I'm noticing that the text here might be a little bit hard to read. That gray is different on my screen than on the projector. But what this says is there's a comment to the right of spawn that says non-blocking, and to the, to the right of wait that says blocking. So that's to say, when we take an IO action and we spawn it, we create an event that corresponds to um, what is going to happen when that I.O. action finishes. Um, and we can wait on that event to synchronize with it and actually get out the value that uh, is the result once the actual event happens. But by separating the starting of the I.O. action running and the waiting on it to complete, um, and under the hood there's some implicit concurrency, um, we can write parallel programs that do things like fetching lots of things from the internet and displaying pictures of animals. Um, I'll also note that Diamond um, has these useful functor and applicative instances, which will come in handy later. Um, because if I have an event that returns me something of type A, and I have a function that transforms an A into a B, then I can produce an event that returns something of type B. No sweat. So it's also the case that for any event, um, 
We'd like it to be true that if we wait for an event, and then we take exactly the same event, not an event spawned from the same IO action, but the exact same event handle, and wait for it again, um, we're going to get the same value. So, you know, you wait for some computation and it returns you a picture of a dog, and you wouldn't expect that if you then wait on that same event, the event already having finished, you'd then get a picture of a cat. I mean, it wouldn't be a terribly bad surprise, but it would be a little bit confusing. Um, and moreover, just for efficiency, events don't rerun when you wait for them. They just return some cached stored value that is whatever the result is. Um, and there's a caveat down, down there, because uh, if the event runs forever, then we're never going to return. So then we can use this event-based framework to uh, download a bunch of pictures of animals in the background and then display them all at once at the end so that all these downloads are happening at the same time, much as they would be happening if you, say, loaded a web page that had pictures of animals on them. But, I mean, who does that? Um, so the first thing that we do is we spawn off three different events that correspond to getting animals, um, and we store them in this list of events returning pictures called events. And then we just wait on all of the events. Um, we map the wait function across all of the events to get a list of pictures from that list of events of pictures. And then at the end, we just display all of the animals. Well, it's better, right? Well, let's do it. So we start all of the events at the same time. They're all pending. And wow, OK, much faster. But there's something that we sort of lost out on, which is that I had to wait for all of the animals to download before I was even able to look at one. And that's frustrating to me, and that's no good, um, because I want to look at the animals as soon as they appear. So, and that's exactly what has to happen, because when we wait on all of the animal events, what we get back is uh, an event, well, rather, we wait on all of the animal events, what happens is, well, we wait on all of them before we can proceed. And we don't know which one is going to happen first, so we can't synchronize on which one happens first. We're sort of stuck. Now, suppose we could figure out which event happened first among some set of events that was all pending at the same time. We could, we could race events together. So a lot of event-driven programming libraries will give you this primitive called wait any. Um, at least that's what's, what it's called in the Haskell async library. Um, it goes by a couple of names. Basically, um, it gives you, it, uh, it, it takes some list of events and it gives you back an event that corresponds to the result of whichever of, the, whichever of those events uh, returned first. So out of wait any, we can redo our animal downloading function. We can, as usual, spawn off the three events that download the animals uh, concurrently. And then instead of waiting on all of the events, we wait for any of the events to finish. And then we display that animal. So we can ask for, well, what's the fastest animal? And as soon as the first one finishes, we find out what the fastest animal is. <laughs> but then we're sort of stuck, because we lost the other two animals. And we only got to look at one picture of a cute animal. And, uh, and so it feels like there's some kind of a trade-off being made. We can either get the first event um, that download, uh, we get the first event that occurs and then lose all the rest of the events, or we can wait for all of them to finish, but we have to wait for all of them to finish before we can see any of them. And there's really nothing we can do here because we've lost our handle to the events. I mean, sure, yeah, they still exist in the list of events, but we don't know which event actually returned. Wait any doesn't give us that information. So, a question, right? What abstraction would we actually need to be able to say, and then what next? Um, I would propose that we, I would propose that we see if we can build this. 
Uh, the type's a little bit complicated, so I want to break it down just a little bit. It returns to us, given a list of events of type A, the result of the first event to complete. And then it also returns to us a context into the original structure of events that consists of what were all of the events that aren't yet done that happened to the left side of the particular event that did finish? And what are all of the events that haven't yet finished that happened to the right side of the event that did finish? Now, this might look a little bit familiar to some of you, but don't worry if it doesn't. So some of you might have realized that this looks a lot like a concept that's sort of functional folklore um, called a zipper. And this was first described by, by Gerard Huet um, in 1997 um, in a, a really nice functional pearl. So a zipper is just a little data structure that allows us to represent a context into some other data structure. So for example, a list with one hole um, where one of its elements should be. So if we had the list 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, then the zipper, a particular value of a zipper into that data type would be 1, and then, oh well, you know, there's a hole here, and then 3, 4, and 5. And what Hue realized is that we can represent a zipper into a list or some other data type as a data type itself, that a one whole context into a data type is itself a data type. So a list zipper is just a list of all of the things to the left of the whole and all of the things to the right of the whole. Um, it's, it's just a functional pointer into some particular position within a data structure. So the natural question is, and I kind of, I kind of uh, mentioned this, is that if we can do this for lists, what other types can we do it for? Um, now, I want to say, um, it's known how to generically derive zippers for arbitrary al algebraic data types. But I want to say, let's, let's not cheat. Let's see if we can figure it out for ourselves. Because a lot of these things just sort of fall out if you think enough about it. So I want to propose a notation for algebraic data types. And some of this was, uh, was referenced in the excellent previous talk. Um, where we can talk about types or sets as, um, as having this uh, sort of algebraic structure where we would say that in, instead of writing void for the empty type, that is to say the type with no inhabitants, we'd write zero. And instead of writing, uh, you know, open parenthesis, close parenthesis for the unit type, we'd write just one. Um, that is to say it's the type with one inhabitant. Um, and I'm going to say that our language of types also includes type variables and some types like either um, and product types like tuples. And the reason for doing this is because there's a whole lot of types that could possibly exist. Like it's an open world. Anyone can make their own types. But lots and lots of types are isomorphic to combinations of this simplified language. So if we want to be talking about, well, what types can we have zippers into? It's easier to tackle the question of what types can we have zipper, uh, how do we translate a large swath of the types that we can define into, um, into this generic representation? And then how could we derive a zipper for these particular, this particular generic representation? So we're going to get there. And uh, there's, there's a, uh, I've, I've omitted a particular rule here, uh, the rule for, for uh, recursive types. Um, and I'm going, to, I'm going to point you to uh, the extended abstract that um, we published in uh, Tidy of last year um, for that. Because things get a little bit messy when you try to figure out the rule for mu. And it's uh, mu being uh, the binder for recursive types. But you can, you can get around this. Um, and in fact, we're going to show how recursive types work out. But there are things that are going to just sort of be uh, left unrevealed. Um, and it, and it makes sense, though. It all works out. So just for, for, for getting your feet wet, um, we could say that a list of A is 1 or an A paired with a list of A um, in just the same way that you would write it down as a data declaration in Haskell. Um, so the idea is let's just, one step at a time, figure out what is the type of a zipper into each one of these generic constructors. 
Well, um, for 0 and 1, there's not really any place for any value in a, an empty type. Like, a, a zipper into an empty type can't exactly contain anything because there can't even be a place for a hole in a type that has no inhabitants. And the same kind of reasoning holds for uh, the, uh, the unit type because there's nowhere for anything to fit. It's just a single element. So that means that the type of zippers into both of these, the, the empty type and the, the unit type, both of their zipper types are zero. So we've been a little bit sloppy, and, and maybe that's become apparent as you, were, as you were thinking about the last slide, because what did I actually mean by the element type of a particular data structure? You could think about the element type of a, of a single fixed data structure as being multiple different things. So I want to be more specific. I want to say, what is the zipper with, with regard to elements of some type A for the data type tau, say? And so that means, to, to restate what we already know, the zipper with regard to elements of type A of 0 and 1 is both 0. So, so to reference the slide title, what about variables? Well, there's exactly one place for an A in a, an A, which means that the zipper with regard to elements of type A in the variable A is just one. But there's no place for an A in a B, and so that's zero. Everyone with me so far? So we can just proceed, and there's only two more cases. For plus, we know that for a sum type, it either contains a tau or a sigma. So we just need to say a zipper into some sum type just says, well, is the, hole, uh, is the hole on the left side or the right side? Do I have a zipper into the left side or do I have a zipper into the right side? So the zipper with regard to some type A in tau plus sigma is just either a zipper into tau or a zipper into sigma. And the most complicated rule that I'm going to show you is the one for times. And it's, it's, it's a little bit puzzling at first, but I think it makes a lot of sense. So if I have a product type, that contains both a tau and a sigma, which means that if there's some hole, if there's some particular element that I've spliced out of it, um, it has to be in either the tau or the sigma which means that either we've got some zipper on the left-hand side and then an untouched sigma, or we've got a tau and some zipper on the right-hand side, which just gives us this rule that says, oh, well, the zipper of a product type is the sum of a zipper of the left-hand side and the right-hand side, or the left-hand side and the zipper of the right-hand side. For instance, like if we just had a pair of A and A, then a zipper into this is either, well, it's an A on the right side or it's an A on the left side. This is, by the way, recursively invoking the variable rule. All right, so remember that our list data type, our favorite data type, um, or at least for the moment, um, is just one or uh, an A and another list. So we can try to figure out, all right, well, what's a list zipper? We already know that a list zipper based on Hue is just a pair of lists. So we were hoping that this sensibility check is going to give us back something that it looks exactly like a pair of lists. So using the sum rule, we see that we have a sum of 1 and an A and a list of A. And that is to say the product of A and a list of A. So we split that up, now saying, a zipper into 1 and a zipper into a times list a. And then we use the product rule to split up the product that's here um, into the two possible cases that either there's a hole in the a or there's a hole in the list. And then using the variable rule, we can simplify this because we know that if, there's, if there is a hole in an a, then it's going to 
just be the single unit, that there, this is precisely what a zipper into a variable looks like, as we just saw. And then we can simplify it by removing zero plus and one times, because just like in algebra, in types, these things are isomorphic. If I have uh, either void x, then that's isomorphic to x. And if I have unit, uh, if I have like a pair of unit and x, then that's isomorphic to x. So we've gotten back something that, well, it's, it's a type, but it's sort of unclear exactly how it matches up to what we want to be looking at. So just to make it a little bit more clear, I'm just going to write it down in a more uh, Haskell-y notation and say that our new list zipper, list, list zipper prime, the one that we actually derived by running through these rules that we came up with, um, it, you're either at the end and you have some list of A, or you take some step that contains a single list of A and another list zipper prime of A. Well, it's not quite the same type as our original list zipper, but it's, it's close. I still don't know, though, how you get from one to the other. So I want to I want to I want to just explicate that really clearly. So given some particular context, uh, let's say we're talking about the context where you have some list that's five elements long and the whole happens in the very middle. We might represent that context using our original list zipper uh, representation as like the list one, two, and the list four, five, with the hole in the middle. With our new list zipper prime uh, zipper, we would represent this as saying, well, take a step that holds a one, take a step that holds a two, and then the rest of the list is four, five, all at once. And so in general, if I have some context into a list that has some hole in the middle of it, then our original list zipper represents it as the front part of the list and then the back part of the list. But our derived list zipper implementation represents it as a sequence of steps recursively going down, each of which corresponds to an element of the front half of the list. And then when you get down to the very bottom, you dump the entire back half of the list all at once in the place where nil ordinarily would be in an ordinary list. And these things, these are actually the same. Uh, these, are, these, are, these are isomorphic uh, types. Because you can just strip off all of the steps from the front and turn it into an ordinary list and pair it up with the thing at the end. And vice versa, you can go in the other direction. OK, so let's take a breath. And then all together now, I want to show you all the rules that we just figured out. So if you squint at them, if you really squint at them and you stop looking at the Zs, this might look vaguely familiar to you. Um, and I said that this is a known result. And I just want to show you something that I found really beautiful and mind-blowing when I first learned about it. These are exactly the rules for partial derivatives from derivative calculus. <laughs> this picture of a cat is an accurate representation of my face when I read Carter McBride's paper, The Derivative of Regular Type, is its type of one whole contexts. And the title of the paper says really all you need to know as the major takeaway, which is the derivative of a regular type represented as some algebraic structure is its type of one whole context. In other words, to calculate what a zipper for a particular algebraic type is, you just need to translate it into a generic representation that looks like plus and times and one and zero, and then apply all of the same uh, mechanistic rules to get exactly what you're looking for. So the structure of this talk and the structure of this work um, sort of have this merge feeling to them. Like, I, I started walking you down this garden path of event-driven programming, and then somehow, without really explicitly saying so, we ended up talking about type-directed generic zippers. And I haven't really, like, 
brought you back to where we actually have been going all of this time. Um, because I've, you've noticed that I haven't been downloading any more animals for a while, and instead I've been showing you math. So, uh, so we'll get back to the animals, I promise. Um, and, and, and to sort of bring things in the direction that I want to, I want to note, there's one type that we haven't accounted for. And if we're going to try to understand um, how we're going to uh, talk about event-driven programming using this kind of zipper representation, what about events? This type representation makes no allowance for higher kind of types um, or type constructors. It feels like we've, we've sort of like gone ever so slightly astray. And there's got to be some way of unifying us with where we want to actually go. Um, remember that we wanted this. We wanted this, but we wanted it more generic. And, and I claim that this should be equivalent to some function of type wait any rest, uh, sorry, fun some function wait any rest of type this. But you'll notice that I've put question marks where the derivative with respect to. So remember, the derivative with respect to something is the zipper of something with elements of type, like, sorry, the derivative of, with respect to A of some type is the zipper into that type where we consider elements as being type A. But the zipper, and I want you to look at the top of the slide, the zipper here isn't quite an ordinary list zipper. In particular, it has this middle bit. And the middle bit is that result from the event that actually did fire. So we've been taking the derivative with respect to a type variable. And that's the existing work uh, that, uh, that's in uh, Carter McBride's paper, which is an excellent paper. It's really cool. If you want to dive deeper into understanding how this stuff works, I highly recommend it. Um, but that doesn't quite give us exactly what we want. So instead of replacing every occurrence of a type, of a type variable with a hole, what are our holes? Well, if we want to pluck out a something from a structure full of events, if we want to wait on all of the events, then I would say our holes aren't a particular type. There are events. Everywhere, an ev everywhere where an event shows up in the structure, um, that's a potential place where we could run, where, where that event could run, produce a result, and that result could be inserted into a context. So I would say, we need to take a derivative with respect to a type constructor, not a type variable. And I propose this rule, because after all, when you, when you run an event, when you remove a diamond, you get back the thing that was inside. Because after all, diamonds are eventually. So if we run the same computation, um, we get back a slightly different type. So this is, this is trying to take the derivative with respect to diamond of a list of diamond A. And this should give us back a type that's isomorphic to the return type of our weight anything. And indeed, if you look at it, well, you, we either have an A and a list of diamond A, or we have a diamond A and another uh, zipper into the list. So we've got exactly that extra A positioned exactly where it needs to be. These are isomorphic. So that's not a rigorous proof that this is exactly what we want. There's a lot more details to showing exactly why this just makes sense and works so well. But I would say there should be a way. What this leads us into is trying to write this because We've been trying to sequence over lists. We've been trying to, uh, we've been trying to wait on uh, a list of things and get the first thing that happens and then a context into the rest. But I want to incrementally synchronize the events in any data structure. I want to be able to take a tree of events that correspond to animals. And I want to be able to fill that tree as quickly as possible or do any number of other things. So, we have this function wait any 
that takes a list of events and gives us a particular event, whichever one happened first. And we want this function choose, which does the same thing, but gives us back the result in its context. I would say we need something to bridge exactly the gap between those two types, so that if we take these functions, and I'll talk about this in just a second, like suppose we have this function locations. Locations can be plugged into right, after, right before we ate any, so that locations gives us a list of events. And what locations does is locations says, I will give you a list of events such that each event corresponds to um, a particular event in the original uh, data structure, the A. Um, I will wait on that event, and then when that particular event is done, I'm going to give you back a context surrounding that value. So now we wait for any of those events to be done, and the first one that happens will give us the appropriate context surrounding the appropriate value of whichever event happened first. Okay, I know that was a lot, so I'm gonna show you some pictures. So say we have three events, red, green, and blue, and I'm sorry if some of you are colorblind. Um, uh, what we first wanna say is we take the red event um, and we say um, we construct a function that takes some x and then inserts that x at the position where the red event was, where the red event would be in a zipper into the original list, leaving the other events in the appropriate places in the context. And then we f map that function over the red event so that when the red event fires, the result that we'll actually get back from this composite event that we've created will be precisely a contextualized result x with uh, green and blue to its right. And we do this exactly the same for the other types. And this can be made generic. So that's uh, the, the, one, of, one, of the, one of the things that I haven't really talked about is that we use uh, we use the generic frameworks uh, in GHC, GHC generics, um, to actually implement a lot of this stuff. So look, this is locations for a list, but you'll notice that the type of locations is much more general. Um, and the, the big contribution, uh, one of the big contributions of this work um, is that we actually compute these things. We actually have a library that does this, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so back to cute animals. Um, how can we use this? So, as before, we spawn off a particular three uh, animal downloading events, and then we use this new combinator that I'm gonna define. It's called for events. And it takes a list of events of type A, and it takes some action that consumes a value of type A and just run, like, runs an IO action, and then gives us an IO action. Like, it doesn't do anything meaningful, it doesn't give us a meaningful result type. So, if the events are nothing, then there's really nothing to do, so we just immediately return. But if the events aren't, then we choose over them to get back a context where we have L's being the left-hand events, the result being the result of whichever event happened first, and R's being all of the, the events on the right-hand side that haven't happened yet. We perform our action on the result, and then we recursively call four events on all of the remaining events that haven't fired yet. So if you put that together, we can choose all of the animals and look at them exactly as they show up. So we spawn them concurrently, but then as soon as one happens, we get this wonderful elephant and this bird and this smaller bird. <laughs> so, as I was saying, we implemented the stuff, mostly. Um, this is uh, all available on a GitHub repo that will be several slides from now. Um, but we're still tweaking the high-level API, um, and uh, I would love to have conversations with people about some of the difficult design issues that we've had in figuring out um, how to present these generic types to people. 
Um, in particular, one issue is that while you can take, while you can use generics to take the derivative of an arbitrary type, um, it's not clear how to go back from some generic value representation that's just sums and products into something that's more sensible and clean and enjoyable to work with. Um, and there are several different type class architectures that we've played with, but none of them has seemed like it's a total, like, this solves everything that we care about. Um, there's a lot of low-hanging optimization fruit, um, uh, which is uh, yet, to be, uh, yet to be taken care of. Um, don't use this in production. <laughs> um, there, and, and, the, and like I was saying, uh, there's, there's some of these trade-offs related to generic programming in Haskell, um, which we think are completely uh, overcomable, um, but uh, there's definitely work to be done there. Um, I'd also like to say, um, really, lists are just the beginning. Throughout this talk, I've been using this simple motivating example, um, using a list of events that download animals, um, because it's a lot easier to uh, think about lists and derivatives of lists, at least at first. Um, and uh, the, the math just gets hairier and takes up more slide space um, when I'm showing you other data structures. But with just about any data structure, um, you can get some interesting behavior. So with different shapes of trees in particular, because I mean, in functional programming, really what isn't some particular shape of tree? Um, you can derive file system monitoring um, and DOM handling for GUIs and hierarchical process management and more complex animal picture download managers. Um, and, uh, and all of these through this kind of event-driven framework um, so that you don't have to mess about with threads. Um, and we have some examples of these and we're working on some of the others. Uh, and definitely come talk to me afterwards or Jennifer who is somewhere over there. Um, uh, to, to talk about this. So I think one of the last things that I want to make a note of is that we've got this wait any function and wait any is the only thing in choose that's not like really generic because it's specialized to diamond. Um, what if we had wait any for some type that's not diamond? Um, and so, you know, like if you go hoogling about, uh, you will find that there's this thing that exists. Um, that if something is an applicative functor and has this extra monoidal structure that makes it into an alternative, that is to say that if you have two FAs, you can squash them together and get one FA, then there's this function A sum, of course, that just folds together an entire list of FAs to get you just one of them. And we know that events have this structure because that just takes two events and picks whichever one happens first. So there are other things that, has this that have this structure. And so we can just say that instead of using wait any, if we use a sum, then the type of choose is morally. And note that uh, I'd like to retroactively note that so much of the slides that I've shown you, so many of them, um, are missing type class constraints because they would just take up too much space. There's lots of noise about uh, like requiring generic instances for particular types and analogous stuff. But Basically, we'd want to say that choose has this very, very general type. Um, so lots of things are alternative, not just events. And they all give us, not all of them, but some of them give us interesting semantics for choose. So most parser combinator libraries are, have parsers, like a parser of A and a parser of A can be combined into a parser that uh, parses whichever thing happens first. So if I have a list of parsers and I choose over it, what I'll get is a thing that is parsed and then a bunch of parsers that were not yet returning any valid parse. So you just naturally what falls out of this is parsing permutations like say parsing the flags on tar that doesn't, it doesn't matter what order you put them in there as long as you remember that it has to be like a, a bunch of like X, V, Z, F. Um, and sort of like dually almost, um, random generators also have uh, 
also have alternative instances. Because if I can generate randomly an A, and I have another random generator for an A, then I can just flip a coin and generate either from one or from the other. So what this means is, that is if I have a list of generators of A, then if I choose that, then I get an A and then a context that represents all of the generators that I haven't generated anything from yet. Um, and that ends up being useful if, say, you want to throw away all of the less prioritized generators or something like that. Um, STM, um, I only discovered this this morning. STM has an alternative instance. Maybe that's good for something interesting. <laughs> I suspect that if you chose over a list of STM things, you would get, you would, you would get some interesting application of this. And so I, what I want to say is maybe your favorite thing of kind star to star could also have interesting properties um, as long as it's alternative. Um, and I would love to hear about people's thoughts on um, how we can sort of uh, what, what other kinds of semantics can we assign to choose? Because it's a really, gener it's a really generic thing, and it, uh, it'd be really interesting to see if there's some unifying theory for what makes a functor interesting for it. Because, for instance, identity is completely non-interesting. It just picks whichever is the first event in the list, um, and so is maybe. And it seems like pretty much anything with just a completely fixed behavior that doesn't have any non-deterministic input or uh, random behavior or dependence on the outside world, that, those all seem really boring. The interesting ones are the ones that, uh, that have some notion of it could come out one way or it could come out another way. You could be uh, on the left side or you could be on the right side. Um, so, um, and I would invite you to check out um, this picture of a cat, and more importantly, maybe, um, our GitHub repository, uh, which has um, all of the code that we've worked up so far for this, um, as well as the uh, extended abstract from Tidy, um, where we flesh out a little bit more of the theory, including the mu rule for recursive types that I have uh, very carefully avoided ever talking about. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>